the people must have access to financial justice. Martin North, John Adams, in the interest of people. Hello, John. We're back in the studio once again. How are you, mate? I'm pretty good. Yourself? Pretty good. Good. And we're going to continue our conversation about ASIC and related matters. Yes, yes. So, so, so this episode, Martin, is part four of our series on financial crime. And uh, we alluded to this episode in our highly anticipated part three, which, <laughs> which is a lot of people has uh, around the world have watched it. But, but what we said in, in, in the last show, Martin, was that um, I was able to get an investigation into ASIC um, uh, but we, I had to go through extraordinary lengths to actually uh, uh, put an investigation together and to put a solid, comprehensive complaint of, report, uh, of a report of alleged misconduct. And the question for policymakers and for the public at large is, is that, am I the standard or, or should I be the exception? Because obviously what we've tried to document throughout this series is, is that there are a whole, a whole host of people across the country that have interacted with ASIC and have come up empty-handed, whether it's uh, investors, whistleblowers, consumers, lawyers, barristers, etc. And and so um, what, the, what I want to sort of talk about in terms of this particular episode is, is a new initiative I've been working on. So in the last few months, as the my investigation came to a close and we gave the task i started going into uh, having a deeper dive into asics numbers and these are the numbers that we uh, showed in part two now what i want to what i want to do with this information is is that um i've put a report together um uh, that i've been drafting over the last couple of months um, and the report sort of uh, stands about 70 pages. So let's actually put the front page on the screen. So this is going to be the Adams report. This is not commissioned by anyone. This is just me, uh, you know, doing crazy things in my own house and mm. writing, writing a 70-page report because I feel like writing it. And really it's, it's to bring out all the themes that we've discussed in the last few shows, both in terms of my experience but ASICs, uh, uh, in terms of their numbers, four corners, all of this sort of stuff, and to really call for a new inquiry into ASIC, but a very specific inquiry. And so what I'm going to be asking for is the Parliamentary Joint Committee on uh, for Corporations and Financial Services, um, asking them uh, to hold a specific inquiry into ASIC's handling of reports of, uh, of alleged misconduct their uh, willingness and, and their process around uh, commencing investigations, the management of whistleblowers, and, and to, to get to the heart of why is it so hard? Why has their performance become worse over time, as we documented in part two? And what is the proper expectations of Parliament? Because obviously, obviously Parliament is the one that basically passes the laws. Um, they, they provide the budget. They expect ASIC to uh, to enforce the laws they pass, and and obviously to enforce the law, you need to have a willingness to investigate and to uh, handle reports of alleged misconduct in, in, in the appropriate fashion. And and I think uh, what we've demonstrated in the last few shows is that that's just not happening in this country. No, John, and I think one of the observations I have is that the normal processes of review that Parliament should have over ASIC aren't being very effective, right? Because clearly that 0.74% success rate is way too low. And so there needs to be a different way of thinking. So hopefully this report might actually catalyze some changes and a deep dive to really expose what's going on because it's worth underscoring, isn't it? The data that you're presenting is, well, really, it's ASIC data. Yeah, 100%. So, so, so that is correct. The data is from ASIC's own annual reports. Now, uh, a couple of elements uh, to, to just convey to the audience is, is that uh, in early August, so, so we did a show um, uh, uh, around early August around explosive discussions in Parliament. And, and, we, and in that episode, we talked about economic concepts. But the reason why I went to Parliament was to go talk to various members of Parliament about ASIC and ASIC's performance. And so we, I wasn't ready to sort of reveal my hand at that point about why I was in Parliament. So I, I have spoken to the majority of the committee, but I've also spoken to a whole host of members and senators across the board. And, and the one thing that I found quite shocking, Martin, is that 
Uh, I've been in political circles for 20 years. I've never seen a issue or, an, or a government department or agency that has uh, the same level of concern universally across the political spectrum like in terms of ASIC. So it doesn't matter if I spoke to the Greens or to One Nation or to Labor or Liberal or the UAP, etc. There is uniform, uniform concern that they're, that they're just not doing the job that Parliament and the public expects. Because obviously, when something goes wrong of a financial nature, well, who hears it the most? It's the politicians. Mm. And so the politicians are basically saying, well, we know there's a problem because we've obviously had the 2014 review into assets performance by the Senate Economics References Committee. We've had the Royal Commission. We've had the Sterling Inquiry. Um, um, and, and yet... Uh, there just doesn't seem to be the the the, the change happening that the parliament happened. So so for anyone now now I'll, I will make a couple of points, Martin. Is is that uh, in our last show uh, and and so, so some of this commentary was on social media because we turned the comments off. Some people were frustrated that we didn't go into the specifics <laughs> of, of my uh, particular case, and the, the reason why we can't is is because and, and and some people may not be aware of this is that it is actually a criminal offence to obstruct or hinder. A government investigation, and particularly in terms of ASIC. So, uh, once ASIC has declared an investigation, and you're made aware of it. You're supposed to be basically hands off, and you've got to allow law enforcement to do their job. And if you get in the way, or if you interfere in that type of investigation, well, uh, ASIC can come after those individuals, um, and they have in the past. And so, so that's where some of the advice has come to me, particularly from my some of from some of the people in my team who have uh, a previous experience with ASIC, they've said you've just got to respect the process and allow the process to occur. So, so that's point one. But point two is, is that um, there has been a, a, a concern to say, well, um, and we alluded to this in the, in the last show, well, you get an investigation, so what? Um, nothing's really going to change because, uh, because the, the way this country works is the way this country works and there's no appetite for change uh, among among the elite establishment and so um that 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 is obviously a, a you know a deep frustration that people have uh and yet um even though i understand where that source of frustration comes from uh the, the my, my view is is that you still have to play a proactive and productive role to try to facilitate change where you think you can and i think that in this area even if our viewers have concerns with politicians. What I can say on the record is that politician, the politicians, the, the politicians who I've spoken to, have a genuine uh, concern about financial crime, white collar crime, and they have a, obviously a, a, a very strong appetite for the laws that they pass to be to, to be followed and adhered to, mm. and for consumers and investors to be protected. Um, and obviously, if that's not happening, even after more resources and more money has been given to ASIC, well, then uh, politicians have there is a there is an air in Canberra, if I can say that way, for politicians to actually try to fix the problem. So, so now the question of it obviously is Adams Adams wants an inquiry, and who is Adams to call for an inquiry? So you know, because the Parliament has the prerogative to ignore me if they wish. So we're going to. So in the next week and a half, well, I will conclude the report. I will I will uh, uh, send it to Parliament and say this is the Adams report, seventy two pages, my comprehensive analysis into ASIC's uh, handling of these matters. Uh, we will put out a press release, and there, there may be some pr uh, articles in the mainstream media about the Adams report. But the question is, is well, who is Adams, and why does Adams get an inquiry if if he calls for it? And and so the key the key issue and the key thing that our audience needs to understand is is that. While I was successful in what I wanted, which was an official investigation, um, the the chances of the public at large to replicate what I did are very low. And so, if this issue is not fixed, you are going to see other examples moving forward where there there are financial crime scandals, where people go to ASIC and and and, and then they're not getting the right sort of outcome. So, um, you know. If I'm going to be completely honest, Martin, no skin of mine knows if Parliament says go away, John Adams. We're not going to hold an inquiry, but 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 I think there is uh, there's an interest by the public and the politicians to actually get on top of this so that we can make the system better. Um, and then the, obviously the other question is, well, we've already had two inquiries. We've had a royal commission, and, and, and according to our own data, the performance is getting worse rather than better. And so this is where I've said to some of the politicians that you can't just have an inquiry for the sake of an inquiry. Th this 
if we do have an inquiry based on the Adams report, it has to be it has to be focused on driving real change, and the Parliament has to be very particular and very forensic as to understand why are these trends at ASIC happening the way they are, and what does it, what will it really take? Is it more money? Is it is it better technology? Which is which, there's been a recent report by um, uh, Nicholas Moore, the Financial Regulator Assessment Authority. They've said there's been there are big problems with investment at uh, ASIC in terms of uh, data and technology. So is that the issue? Is it staff? Is it leadership? I mean, I mean these are the the, the big questions that. Uh, Parliament has to grapple with, and obviously Parliament has to set the expectations as to to ask this is what we expect, um, uh, and, and obviously if you can't deliver, well, we're, we're going to start, start calling for heads to roll. So, um, so, so they're, they're the things that I'm I'm hoping we we were able to achieve, and, and obviously I've had a range of uh, emails and um, communications over the last week from interested parties who have. Uh, who are either interested in this topic or who have had some previous experiences with ASIC and obviously are interested to see if we can actually drive change and reform uh, in 2022 and 2023 and actually try to make the agency better for the entire country. Mm. Now, John, I have one particular question here. Um, when you speak to the politicians, are they um, knowledgeable about the performance of ASIC or do they not actually know it is an issue? Um, because of course that is quite an interesting observation, right? If they if they don't know about the data that's there, and they see the data, they might change. Whereas if they know that the ASIC's bad and the data just reinforces it, maybe they've got less likelihood to do something. Well, so 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 what I would say is there is I think there's before I met them and I was showing them some of this data, there is a genuine concern with ASIC mm. across the, the, the across the political spectrum in federal parliament. But but and, and and none of the politicians who I spoke to was aware of the data that I was quoting. Uh, and, 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 and despite and, the fact that it's ASIC data that's yes. published on a regular basis. Yes. And despite the fact that ASIC is actually under review within the parliamentary system on you know periodic basis. Yes. Yes. Right. Well, it was, see, even though the ASIC is under review, I mean, there's all sorts of things that um, typically uh, the Parliament looks at, particularly in terms of laws, pol public policy issues, which are related to parts of the financial system, super corporations, etc. Et uh, I mean, there have been some some uh, uh, amount of focus about ASIC's performance, but 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 yeah, who has really uh, invested the time to actually crunch ASIC's own numbers and, and actually understand where these things are going? Um, I mean, not that that really ha that really hasn't happened. And and the, and the one thing I will just say, Martin, is is that sometimes the the media and some people in Parliament and, and public at large focus on the outcomes of investigations. How many people have been prosecuted? Mm. How many people have gone to jail? The size of fines, etc. Uh, I haven't focused on that at all because, to my mind, it it, it 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 depends on the case. It depends on the quality of the evidence. It depends on the circumstances, and 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 I think it's dangerous to potentially make sweeping generalizations about that that particular aspect because um, because because I think it's very circumstantial. But I think what we can say that. Uh, uh, in a more general sense, is we you know in terms in terms of there the, there needs to be a willingness and an eagerness to investigate reports of alleged misconduct, um, and 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 we can't have a situation where even they've got more money, more staff, they're doing less investigations, um, and that there are more reports being submitted to ASIC that result in no further action. I mean, I mean that to me just doesn't tell it doesn't send the wrong signal. So it doesn't send the right signal to the public. It doesn't send the right signal to the financial system and 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 and, and those who may be uh, thinking of engaging in financial criminality. Um, and so, um, just like how, um, uh, in, in terms of Justice Hayne, I mean Justice Hayne in the Royal Commission said, you you just don't want the law to be enforced. It has to be seen to be enforced so people um, think twice before they do something wrong. Mm. And um, one other observation, John, of course, is we've got $3 trillion in superannuation invested in Australia. So it's not like financial investments is just a small part of society, right? This is actually right at the heart of the way our society works at the moment. So what that means is that almost anybody who's got an investment is at risk, potentially, of actually being, um, you know, fooled out of or otherwise misled 
around their financial investments unless we have a strong watchdog that's actually doing the right thing. This is why this is a critical issue, because it isn't just a minority sport, is it? This is actually really mainstream stuff. Oh, absolutely. And, and, and I would say, obviously, you know, super is an, obviously an important point, but mm. there's a whole host of investments across Australia that, that are outside the superannuation system. But also the other thing is, is that uh, there's more than, I think, 2.93 million uh, companies in Australia. And, and obviously ASIC is responsible for managing the conduct in terms of companies. So, yeah. so, so, so yeah, so, I mean, ASIC is, has, has, I mean, look, there was a recent report that said that ASIC has one of the broadest mandates in the world in, in terms of comparing them to other like-minded um, uh, regulators in other jurisdictions mm. and so so yeah so they have a very broad mandate and obviously you want to make sure so it could be that maybe their mandate is too broad and there has been some discussions about whether you need to break up ASIC into maybe two regulators that, that are focusing on maybe co companies uh, one financial system in terms of the other rather than having it all in, in one house but 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 obviously wh whatever the, the the formulation is you want it to actually ensure that that uh, that people are protected, and that uh, you're not having, uh, for example, in the in the four corner story, someone running around this country for ten years, um, being untouched, ripping people off left, right, and centre. Mm. And of course, if there's a parallel with APRA, because APRA, of course, has responsibility for the financial system and, and and for the banks, but really they focus on the corporate side rather than on the consumers and the fallout of consumers. In a way, ASIC is also straddling, right? Because it's basically got the responsibility around the corporate side, but also the investment side and the consumer side as well. So, so I wonder whether they're trapped in those two sides and whether they tend to sort of spin towards the corporate end rather than actually individual investors and individual people who get ripped off. That's, for me, part of what this inquiry should be looking at. The interesting th point on that one, Martin, is, is that there is a view out there that there is a revolving door because because you start to think to yourself well where does ASIC get its staff mm. um, it actually gets it from 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 the regulated population um, so so people from the banks people from the law firms they typically go from private practice into ASIC or people may come from university into ASIC and they go out to the private sector yeah. and so there's a question as to um, to what ex to what extent is ASIC and the staff inside ASIC are independently minded to strongly enforce the law or do they have friends? Do they have relationships? Uh, is there regulatory capture? Um, and, and, but also one of the important aspects of the inquiry that I want to have is, is that how does ASIC exercise its internal discretion? Because obviously the, the decision to investigate or not to investigate is a discretion, discretionary decision for ASIC and, and, and there is no transparency about that. What cases do they approve for investigation? Is it the small cases? Is it the large cases? Um, you know, uh, th th there's been a view uh, in the 2014 inquiry to say that political pressure or media pressure uh, can can influence ASIC to commence investigation, uh, irrespective of the merits of the case, because you know they want to obviously put public fires out, etc. So, so all of that has to be properly considered, um, so that we you know we, we get the right outcome. Now, one thing I will say is that. On the uh, 8th of September, I had the opportunity to meet ASIC about my report. So, so this was uh, uh, an opportunity for me to meet a couple of senior officials and talk uh, in, in a more broader sense about what ASIC does and ha in, terms of how, uh, in terms of how they do it. So I won't disclose too much of what, we, what was discussed because it was, it was very, very high level. It wasn't very specific about my report, although we did talk about some of the data and some of the trends, et cetera. But, but what I will say is that um, th this, this report that I'm uh, about to finalise is that it is part of not just my own experience, but it's also based on other people with first-hand experience, it's, it's, it's ASIC's own data, but it's also been informed by conversations with ASIC and they were able to give me a, a, a bunch of interesting insights that led me to think about a few issues in a different way, triggered me to do a bit of additional research. And so we've just been making over the last couple of weeks some additional refinements and adjustments to the report. And uh, so, yeah, so hopefully uh, we're able to... Um, uh, come to the that's uh, to, to a conclusion on it and uh, hopefully it will be received by the public in parliament uh, in the in a positive light mm. that's worth saying john isn't it that since uh, we met our earlier shows we have had a number of people contact us with stories and you know parallel experiences so it is something that's actually touching quite a lot of people and quite a few people feel they've been hand, handled very badly by ASIC and haven't 
been able to get what they feel is right from it. So I guess the question emerges, what if people have thoughts and if they've got experiences they want to relay what's the best way to do that yes so so so, so what i would like over the next week week and a half if, if people are inclined um if, if you are so so, so the, the, the the three sort of areas i'm looking at is if you if you've if you do have first-hand experience dealing with asic one two if you are a member of the legal fraternity a lawyer or a barrister who had who, who has actually dealt with asic two and three is if you're a part of the regulated population so if you're an auditor or a liquidator or if you're a financial advisor etc and you've actually um been um uh you know asic regulates you and you have a particular story or if you're interested to potentially look at my report and actually provide some input um, while we're trying to finalize in the last few stages that would be great now uh, maybe in the next week and a half martin once we conclude the report and we uh, i put out a press release maybe we'll come back and and, and talk about the report we'll provide a copy for for, the, for those interested parties in our audience who would like to read the adams report and uh, obviously i think there will be a role for uh, the broader community to, uh, for those interested and in who, who agree with my point of view, to contact specific politicians and, 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 and encourage them to hold an inquiry so that we can actually improve ASIC's performance. And that, uh, and again, so, so, so this is no Adam's vendetta because, to, can I be completely honest, Martin, is that had I not got the investigation and I was calling for an inquiry into ASIC, people would say, this is John Adams with sour grapes. Well, no, I don't have sour grapes. So so I got what I wanted. But the question is, um, can other people in the community get what they want? Um, and how do we make it easier? Just just to, if I can give you a few practical examples, Martin. So so l- l- a few things that I had to sort of encounter. Let me, let me talk to you about whistleblowers. So um, whistleblowers take a lot of risk, financial, personal, security, a whole bunch of things like that. Um, ASIC, according to their own website, say, it is not for us to determine who is and who is not a whistleblower. It's up to the court. So, so here you have a situation where someone wants to blow the whistle, uh, go to the government and say something's wrong, and yet they don't know if they have the legal protection. Uh, they, they may have to spend their own money to go get legal advice. Um, and then if you do and you still go to ASIC, well, ASIC says, we may or may not accept you, or we may not may or may not uh, consider you to be a whistleblower because we can't determine that. It, you know, it, it's up to the court. So, so that is a huge black box. And think to yourself, well, how are you supposed to have? Co- so, so if the law says if you blow the whistle, you have all these legal protections, and people can't touch you, people can't threaten you. Well, how do you know that you've got those protections definitively, in the legal sense? If ASIC saying, well. Only the federal court can tell you can determine who is and who is not a whistleblower because you know you go to ASIC first before there's any sort of court de- court determination. So so that's a a big issue there. Uh, I mean, uh, particularly for example, anonymous whistleblowers, which which is ASIC is extremely poor about. Mm. You know, another another aspect is, uh, and we've touched about this in the last uh, show, is about evidence. Well, how much evidence is enough? Um, what's the quality of the evidence? What's the format of the evidence? ASIC basically gives no guidance on that. And so, again, it's a complete black box. Uh, people try to take the best guess we can. Obviously, we, for me and my team, we over-engineered it. But there's a whole bunch of people who think, well, okay, th- this should be enough. And it could well be that, that it results in no further action because of insufficient evidence. So, so, so I, think, I think there has to be some guidance around that. I think what would be highly practical is ASIC should do a series of videos on their website and actually mm. say, okay, this is the process to submit the, you know, here's what we are looking for. This is what makes a, a high quality report of alleged misconduct. Um, and, and, and also, one of the things that I would really think would be useful is if there's a hotline. So, for example, if you are going to make a report, you can actually call someone and say, well, how do I make my report the best it can be? Because what ASIC wants, and this is some, some one of the things that, that, that I agree with and ASIC agreed with me in this meeting that we had a couple of weeks ago, is, is that... Uh, in order for ASIC to do their best work, what they want is, uh, I mean, I mean, they want lower, of oh, sorry, fewer lower quality reports and more high quality reports so that they can just basically, you know, understand it, take with it, and then obviously implement it in a more practical sense. So, mm. so, so I don't think they have fully grasped the nettle and the opportunity of 
instructing and educating the public about what is the what is a high quality report and, and obviously how to uh, maybe gives them some tips about how how to be able to put it together in a way that is just practically useful for them both operationally and legally so that uh, they're able to enforce the law sooner uh, because one of the big uh, compl- issues is that uh, one of the big issues with ASIC is not just their willingness to investigate but it's also the time it takes for them to decide to investigate and the, uh, obviously in some cases the length of the investigation itself. Mm, I suppose you could be a bit cynical and say maybe they don't want to stir the hornet's nest up too much because they'll just get more and more and more and more uh, requests for investigation. But surely, if there are issues, they should be wanting to see them. They want to actually know about what's going on rather than actually making it so hard that people just give up in the first place. Absolutely. So so to bring the show to, con- to a conclusion, Martin, is that if anyone would like to engage with me um, while I re- finalise my report uh, about into ASIC, uh, email me at john at adamseconomics.com. Um, uh, feel free to to tell me your story uh, about your interaction with ASIC uh, uh, and, and hopefully together, again, like we've done on other initiatives like with the cash ban, we can actually mobilise Parliament um, to actually uh, serve the public good. Mm. Well, good on you, John. And uh, this is a really, another, again, another important issue. So in the interest of the people, we'll keep pushing it. And um, good luck over the next couple of weeks. Be interested to see where it goes. Thank you very much. Martin North, John Adams, in the interest of the people. We'll see you next time.